Hi, this is Michael Steger with the LaRouche PAC Policy Committee. It is uh, July 28th. This is the Thursday night LaRouche PAC fireside chat. And we are obviously, given what's happened over these last four or five weeks, in one of the most remarkable moments in, 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 in world history. Um, and obviously all of you on the call tonight had the intelligence and basic recognition not to be caught up in what is um, this conventional nonsense and to actually focus on the higher conception and potential of mankind, um, which this kind of historical period presents us. This is obviously a very great challenge. Uh, many people, most people are, are completely unprepared for the crisis that we currently face. But as Helga LaRouche has been very uh, strong in her emphasis, the potential for revolutionary and profound changes to now occur is very possible. And we already see this happening uh, predominantly in the Eurasian world from the Philippines, Japan, and Turkey, various advancements in areas like Syria and Egypt over the last couple of weeks and few years. And the question is for the transatlantic, what will nations like Germany, Italy, and probably most importantly, the United States uh, do in this period? The election is of, not of relevance at this point, but the policies and ideas of Mr. LaRouche and our organization are by far the most relevant conceptions and policies to be discussed. And that's why more than two thirds of the world's population is now largely affected in a positive way by the fight and policies that Lynn and Helga and this organization have waged over the last 40 years. So I'm very happy to introduce tonight uh, Jeffrey Steinberg. He's the uh, counterintelligence editor for Executive Intelligence Review, but he's a person working with Mr. and Mrs. LaRouche for now over 40 years, and he's a very creative and strategic uh, leader of our political movement internationally. So if Jeff, if you're on the line, I'd like, you like to welcome you to the call. Thanks, Mike. Pleasure to be here tonight. Great. So Jeff, why don't you go ahead and if you have some opening comments, uh, why don't you present those and then we'll get the Q&A started and see what people are thinking. Great. Yeah, I think it's important to uh, set the uh, framework for the discussion that we're going to have this evening because we are at an absolutely critical moment where the danger of the strategic situation uh, is actually matched and potentially surpassed by the unique opportunities, opportunities that may very well be uh, once in a lifetime for everybody on this call. And therefore, it's very important to be thinking about this moment in a proper way. So just to give a few critical highlights of where we are, and then I just want to briefly comment on some things that have been on the mind of Mr. LaRouche in discussions that various of us have had with him over the last 48 hours. So tomorrow, July 29th, uh, is a very critical day in Europe because the European Central Bank is handing out report cards on the major European banks, these so-called stress tests of whether or not these banks are in any shape to withstand a new financial crisis. And it already goes without saying that uh, virtually every bank in Italy, led by the world's oldest uninterrupted financial institution, the Monte de Pace Bank of Siena, Italy, uh, will flunk that test. Uh, on a far more important scale, the largest German bank, Deutsche Bank, uh, it has been described recently by the International Monetary Fund as the riskiest bank in the world. They are sitting on $55 trillion in uh, derivatives exposure, and virtually every other major bank in Europe, the United States, Japan, and a few banks even in China are counterparties that are highly exposed. And uh, Deutsche Bank is 
another candidate like Monte di Pace Bank in Italy uh, to blow out at any moment. Both of these banks will almost certainly fail the stress test, and that alone could be a trigger for panic. So we're at a real decisive moment, and the fact that this entire transatlantic financial system is in far worse shape than where things stood in September of 2008 when you had that blowout. Um, this is the principal reason why certain very desperate factions within the Western financial oligarchy uh, are looking for opportunities to change the subject by launching war provocations against Russia primarily and secondarily against China. In fact, every major war that has broken out of any scale, particularly the two world wars of the 20th century, were always the consequence of desperation over a financial crisis in which the power of certain oligarchical forces in the recent history, the British in particular, uh, has been threatened. And they'd rather overturn the chessboard or take irrational risks uh, rather than lose power. The situation today is that any kind of outbreak of war with Russia would almost certainly lead to thermonuclear war. And that would not be a limited war, but would be a full-scale war. So the dangers, as I say, are grave. At the same time, uh, the British Empire, the major source of all of the major problems, particularly in the transatlantic region, is in a state of disintegration. You had the Brexit vote that took place in June, uh, which has shattered the foundations of the entire uh, European Union, which is beginning to come unraveled. You had just Two weeks ago, the long-awaited release on July 6th of the Chilcot Commission report, which was an enormous study of the British role in the launching of the disastrous 2003 invasion of Iraq and overthrow of Saddam Hussein. Had that not happened, you would never have had an Islamic state you would not have had the spread of Al-Qaeda. You wouldn't have the pattern of global terrorism that we're seeing on a literally hourly basis in every part of the world today. So that report, which was comprised of 12 volumes, uh, 6,000 pages, was a stinging indictment. In fact, a war crime indictment against Tony Blair and by extension against George W. Bush and Dick Cheney. At the same time, the LaRouche movement scored an extraordinary victory when President Obama, against all of his intentions and certainly against the interests of the British Empire faction that owns him, uh, was forced to release uh, with very few redactions the 28 pages from the original joint congressional inquiry into 9-11. I'm sure everyone on this call knows that this has been a critical issue, a critical point of intervention by Mr. LaRouche and our political movement since even before the 9-11 attacks. Because in January of 2001, Mr. LaRouche had warned in testimony at the U.S. Senate in the confirmation hearings of John Ashcroft, that a Bush administration would look for the first opportunity to stage a Reichstag fire incident to go for dictatorship. On the day of the 9-11 attacks, LaRouche was being interviewed live on radio in Utah, and he said point blank, this could not be happening without there being an element of an inside job. So the release of those 28 pages particularly coming just nine days after the release of the Chilcot Commission report, uh, is a devastating one-two blow to the British Empire. 
For one thing, when you see the 28-page report and you realize that it was December 2002 when President Bush classified and blocked the release of those 28 pages, you realize that this had everything to do with the run-up to the invasion of Iraq. If that chapter had been released publicly at the time, showing that it was the Saudis, not Saddam Hussein, who was behind the 9-11 attacks, it would have been virtually impossible, even for Bush and Cheney, to get away with that Iraq war. And history would have gone in a very different direction. It was what Mr. LaRouche would call a punctum zalian, a critical point, a crossroads moment in history. So in other words, those developments and others that I won't bother to go through right now, but which may come up in our discussion, mean that the enemy of mankind, the imperial forces now centered in the British Empire, which control Saudi Arabia, which control Obama, uh, are on the ropes. They can be defeated. In fact, they are in the process of going down. The question is, will there be an orderly transition of power and an alignment of the transatlantic region with the policies that have already been adopted by the major nations of Eurasia, centered around China's One Belt, One Road policy, centered around Russia's interest in organizing a global coalition modeled on the FDR-Stalin US-Soviet coalition to defeat Hitler and the Nazis in World War II to defeat the scourge of terrorism. There are ample opportunities, but it requires not just a political mobilization, but an imaginative approach that understands that we as human beings can shape our own future destiny. Rather than thinking of ourselves as victims, we've got to think in a completely different way. And over the last several days, Mr. LaRouche has placed great emphasis on this principle of human creativity. What's totally unique about human beings is that we have the ability to make discoveries, to create things that have never been known, have never been discovered, have never been thought about before. And we're at one of those moments where it's essential that we abandon the horrible core foundations of this current degenerate culture and think once again about producing real scientific geniuses at reviving our space program, which has always been the cutting edge of the great discoveries of mankind, at least during the 20th century. We had a discussion earlier today about one of the great scientists who drove the US space program from the late 40s through the 50s and 60s and beyond, Dr. Kraft Erika, who understood that this kind of process of discovery, of going where man has never gone before, uh, is the essence of what it means to be truly human. So we've got to get out of the small mindedness and reach out and grab onto a moment of absolute unique opportunity. Don't be frightened by the dangers, but understand that we can win a decisive victory if people are willing to think in a completely different way and think as if the future of mankind was resting on our shoulders right now. So let's, on that basis, on that as a sort of a thematic, uh, Mike, why don't we open for discussion? Okay, great. So I'll open up the question and uh, answer uh, line here. Uh, if people want to hit, Ask, ask Jeff Steinberg a question. You hit star six to get into the queue. I'll just remind people of the way the process works. Um, you get a chance to ask a question. You'll hear a voice that reminds you or lets you know it's your chance. Um, please ask us a, a direct question. You can take some time. You can develop it. Make sure you have a clear question in mind. Don't use a speakerphone. 
when the question is over, I will mute you. Uh, that way we can kind of keep the dialogue moving throughout the various questions that come up. So there isn't necessarily a dialogue between you and Jeff. It's a specific question, develop it, and then give Jeff a chance to, to give an answer and, and help move the process along. The point in general is to clarify a sense of resolve and understanding of the current situation where we have to take things as a deliberative process. And that's the intent. So with that, I'll open up the Q&A and let people jump in. Q&A session started. Hopefully I didn't scare too many people. <laughs> okay, Jeff, here's the first question. Great. Uh, hello, um, this is Howard in New York. Hi, Jeff. Hi. Hi. So um, I've been organizing a little bit this week, and uh, but I've been having some questions too, which is um, I've been pretty clear about the uh, the fascist or even Nazi tendencies of uh, of Mr. Trump, and, and yet I've been sort of. Uh, pleasantly surprised uh, and intrigued about this whole little thing about the emails and the Russians and uh, this poor uh, Debbie Wasserman and, uh, you know, the, the treachery of the DNC. Uh, I thought you might have some explanation of this. <laughs> the, look, I think the general situation is that uh, there is a mood of revolt, really a mood of revolution in the population. And at the same time, there's a tremendous frustration that among the so-called candidates for the highest office in the land, uh, none of them live up even remotely close to the standard of what's required. And so there is an enormous gap. And I think that you've got to look at the fact that uh, while we had these shows going on for the last two weeks, um, there was a complete freak out on the part of Wall Street over the fact that both political parties included clear planks calling for the reinstatement of Glass-Steagall in their platforms. That was not the result of anything coming from the uh, nominees of either party. This is a reflection of a long-standing leadership role that's been taken by the LaRouche political movement to put together some of the critical solutions to the crisis. So I think that it's very important to realize that we are in a moment, tremendous crisis and opportunity, and that what's the most important thing is to make sure that regardless of the dangerously poor quality of the candidates of the two major political parties, and I'll include in also the uh, the ticket of the so-called Libertarian Party, Johnson and Weld. We know Weld very well. He was the lead prosecutor, the Grand Inquisitor, uh, who threw Lyndon LaRouche in jail on behalf of the Bush family back in 1989. But the crucial thing is that we're in an existential crisis. There are clear policy solutions, and those policies have to be imposed by us, by our leadership. And increasingly, we're finding that people are turning to our leadership because we have a proven track record and because the policies that we're putting forward are the only thing that's going to work. There's not a sort of a laundry list of things that could be done. There is only one fundamental option. Several years ago, Mr. LaRouche wrote a paper in which he talked about the four cardinal laws that must be implemented to realize a full-blown economic recovery 
which is also tantamount to avoiding the danger of war that's very present right now. So I think that, you know, the media loves to get into real life soap opera drama around, especially once every four years when you've got the presidential elections. But we've got to remain absolutely clearly focused on the fact that what really counts is the dramatic change in policy that must occur if this country and the world are going to survive and make it through this immediate period that we are already entered into. That means the implementation of LaRouche's four cardinal laws. It starts with basically bankrupting the gambling aspects of the economy. Glass-Steagall is a critical instrument as a starting point for wiping out the gambling debt and basically going back to a traditional American system, Hamiltonian approach to banking that's oriented to the real productive economy. The purpose of credit in an economy is to increase the productivity of labor, which means investment in science, in technology, in infrastructure. It means a full-blown revival of the space program. It means moving back into both a revival of nuclear power and beyond that, finally making the breakthrough for commercial fusion power. It means solving the grave crisis of water management, lack of sufficient water to maintain food production, to maintain other services. And that means making new discoveries about how to tap into new previously unknown sources of fresh water. There are literally rivers of water that are in the atmosphere, particularly over the oceans, and there are very tentative preliminary breakthroughs being made on how to tap into and productively access those supplies of water. So these are the kinds of things that need to be being thought about. And, you know, there's a lot of low entertainment here, particularly in this election, because remember that there has never been a time in U.S. history when you had two major party candidates who had such high negative ratings. The main thing that was not widely talked about at the Democratic Convention over the past three, four days uh, is that there were extensive protests going on continuously outside the convention. People who thought that Sanders represented some kind of break with the Wall Street, Washington establishment policies were thoroughly disgusted by his capitulation. And so you've got a mood in the country that is largely raw, uh, in many cases, uninformed, but there is a mood that says we need radical change. And we've got the idea content that's got to be provided. People are desperately looking for leadership on the real bread and butter day-to-day -day policy issues that affect their lives. Everyone knows that the conditions of life today are worse than they were eight years ago when Obama came into office, and they're worse than things were eight years before that when Bush came into office. They may not understand what the policies are to change all of that, but that's what they want. And you, so I think that's where we've got to concentrate. That's where we've got to provide a critical leadership and basically lead people out of this political wilderness. Good. Well, Jeff, you got a lineup of questions. So here's the next one. Hello, this is Jim in San Jose. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Mike. Hi. Uh, you just you just almost gave an answer to the question I was forming. I'm, I'm thinking, what can the average man get 
from the LaRouche team? And and you kind of just answer that. And I pick the term average man because if, if, if you say uh, the citizens or the worse yet, the masses, it sounds like Karl, Karl Marx, but <laughs> you, you, if we find acceptable terms and then a catchy something that's short to get their attention, and then do what you have proposed, which is to elaborate in in simple terms the critical aspects of, of getting us pointed in the right direction. And to the common man, it, like for instance, something along the lines of the World War II, there was a poster that says, Uncle Sam wants you. Everybody saw that and they, they responded to it. I got to go sign up. I got to get in this thing and help. Uh, and that sort of loose lips sink ships, you know, that caught on as, you know, keep your mouth shut about anything that could be classified, that sort of thing. We need something catchy. And I'm thinking out loud and thinking uh, you have a, a picture of Hillary and a picture of, of Trump and then a larger picture of Spock. And you say, sadly, comma, Spock is not available. You know, something catchy and simple that people say, oh, that's pretty outrageous. But, yeah, it's, a, it's also true. You know, what do we got? We got Dumb and Dumber and, and Spock, who might make a good choice if he resided with these uh, U.S. citizens and all that. Uh, you know, but it, those things that you just elaborated, we need to put them in simple terms, one, two, three, boom, and and put them out there. And people can, can get their uh, arms wrapped around that and respond and join in. If we get this, you know, this 500-word page thing, look at it and say, I can't get my head into that. I'm not smart enough. Got to make it. The Army Field Manual some years ago. Hey, Jim. Jim. Fifth grade level. And the question is, Jim. how do we Jim. think about getting everybody's attention to join us? That's it. Okay. All right. Good. The fundamental thing is that uh, the common man uh, should strive for something a hell of a lot better than being common. It's not in the nature of human beings to be common. It's in the nature of human beings to be creative. And um, in a moment like the crisis and the period of great opportunity that we're in right now, it's very important to reflect back on what one of the really great Republican thinkers of the period uh, of the American Revolution had to say. Percy Shelley uh, wrote a critical essay called In Defense of Poetry. And what he said in that essay is that during periods of great crisis, when the very future of humanity is at stake, human beings rise to a higher level. They basically abandon the kind of lazy thinking in which catchwords and slogans are sufficient because there are no catchwords or slogans that really encapsulate what the nature of the situation is. And what Shelley said is that in periods like this, people suddenly find themselves capable of understanding and acting on great profound ideas, ideas that only a very short period of time before they were incapable of grasping. Uh, what happened in World War II was not the impact of slogans. What happened is that the world changed dramatically on the morning of December 7th, 1941. Mr. LaRouche was 19 years old at that time. And so he's speaking from his own direct personal experience. He was in New York City, and it was a Sunday, but he had a business appointment. And uh, he entered that meeting before the announcement about the attack on Pearl Harbor. And, um, you know, basically, as he was walking to that meeting, things were, quote, very normal, very common. People were sort of, you know, walking down the street sort of in a state of drudgery or distraction. And then when he walked out of the meeting, after 
the attack on Pearl Harbor had been announced, people were completely different. They suddenly had to face a strategic reality in the most personal kind of way. People basically stampeded to the draft offices because they understood that something very big had happened in the world and that they had to act in a way that just moments before they were unprepared to act. So yes, it's important to have an effective pedagogy that teaches people how to solve the most pressing problems. But the most critical thing is that human beings were not created to be common. Human beings were created, each and every one of us, to at least potentially make the kinds of creative discoveries that no other creature is capable of. So when you reach a moment like the moment that we're in right now, you've got to think about what's really required. And what's required is what Helga refers to as a complete and total paradigm shift in thinking you've got to begin to think in a completely different way. Rather than thinking, for example, in geopolitical terms about you know, who is our friend and who is our enemy, uh, you've got to think in terms of what kinds of policies can be adopted that will guarantee the future advancement of mankind as a whole. Now, We've been working for more than 25 years on exactly this kind of policy agenda. In 1996, Helga and a group of us were in China uh, speaking at a major conference sponsored by the Chinese government on what was called at that time the Eurasian Land Bridge. That policy has now been adopted and is well underway of implementation by the uh, Xi Jinping government in partnership with countries in the BRICS group, in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, in the uh, Eurasian Economic Union. And there are dramatic changes that are taking place for the betterment of the populations of much of Eurasia. That idea, that mode of thinking is completely missing in the majority of people in the transatlantic region. But we do have this mood. We do have this sense that a revolutionary change in thinking has to happen, that the politics as usual, particularly of the last 15 years, have got to change. People are willing to roll the dice and take tremendous risks simply because they're angry and they see that if we continue on the current path, we're doomed. So it's moments like that where Percy Shelley is absolutely right, that people are capable of taking in much more challenging ideas, concepts that can't be presented in bumper stickers or posters because they know that Everything is on the line. And if we take that approach and take every conversation, every discussion we have with friends, with neighbors, with people who we meet on deployments, uh, then we're going to actually see concretely that this kind of change in thinking is not only vitally necessary, but is possible. And that poses a challenge to everyone on this call to effectively convey those ideas and not fall back on the business as usual, lowest common denominator approach to organizing. Great, next question. Hello, that's me. Hello. You got it, yep. Okay, I'm Dale from South Dakota. What I'm wondering is, who's going to run this new system? Because I don't think either one of our candidates are going to run it, want to run it, and we sure as hell can't get no help out of Congress. So who's going to do all this? 
you've got an emerging leadership in other parts of the world, in uh, China, uh, in Russia, in India. Uh, you've got the Japanese government now looking to align with a whole new set of arrangements uh, that are becoming the dominant factor within large parts of Eurasia. Uh, the one belt, one road policy of China is not some abstract idea. There are rail links that are already fully operational that are running from parts of China into ports in Germany, in France. Uh, the uh, port of Piraeus in Greece is being built up as a major hub for trade between Asia and the southeast part of Europe, running right up into the Danube River Basin. There are proposals that have been discussed uh, that uh, in conferences in Moscow attended by some leading American figures, including our own representatives, calling for extending the Eurasian land bridge into the Western Hemisphere by building the bridge and tunnel across the Bering Straits and linking up to rail lines and water systems running down from Alaska and Canada down the entire Western spine of the United States. So there is basically a sense that these ideas are there and it's not going to come top down necessarily from the quote unquote presidential candidates, but it's going to come from the fact that there are very limited policy options. The American people are demanding changes. And I can tell you that um, we're at a moment where the power of ideas is very, very significant and very powerful. Why is it that both parties have Glass-Steagall uh, in their platforms? Because there has been a political battle, a mobilization that this political movement has been leading in this country uh, for decades. And that's been one of the features of Mr. LaRouche's overhaul of the entire financial and economic system of the United States. When those documents uh, basically included in both parties the reinstatement of Glass-Steagall, uh, there was no doubt in the minds of many leading members of Congress, many people in both political parties, that it was the result of our work. The congratulations to us uniquely were pouring in. The congratulations were pouring in even more so when the 28 pages from the original joint congressional inquiry into 9-11 were declassified and released on the 15th of July. Nobody had any doubt. And so I think you've got to take a very different approach to the question. Rather than looking to others who we know are not qualified to provide leadership, let's consider the means by which we can take leadership responsibility and actually follow it through to where we force the changes in policy. Uh, there are many people now who realize that they've got to be thinking about a completely different economic model for the United States because we've just about reached the bottom of the barrel in terms of the real economy. And many people who were dismissive just weeks or months ago are now craving for discussions with us about what would be the process by which to recreate a system of national banking, which was the cornerstone of the successful policies of every great president we've had in the history of this country from Washington, who had Hamilton as his treasury secretary, to John Quincy Adams, to Abraham Lincoln with the Greenback policy, to Franklin Roosevelt with the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. These are policies that we understand 
And therefore, the proper answer to your question is that we are in the position to provide that leadership. And that is already an established fact. This is not something that's either boastful or some misrepresentation. Don't look to the people that you see on CNN or Fox to provide leadership when everybody knows uh, that they have no leadership qualities. We can force these policy issues through. In an election year, people are responsive to constituent demands in a way that's unprecedented. There would not have been Glass-Steagall platforms in both parties were it not for our work. We'd still be complaining about the fact that the 28 pages that basically indict the Saudis and by extension the British and Bush and Cheney for 9-11 uh, were not released. They are released because of our effort. It would not have happened. Um, under other circumstances, I could take hours to go through a detailed explanation of exactly how it happened. But the point is, it happened because we took responsibility for forcing a change in thinking, for developing the kinds of policies that can work. And we're at a moment right now where the obstacles to forcing those policies to be adopted are greatly limited. Think about the prospect that you could wake up tomorrow morning or next week or any time between now and the November elections and find out that there is a financial collapse process underway that's vastly more serious and more widespread than September 2008. And this time around, people are not gonna simply roll over and accept a bailout or a bail-in in which their own savings are looted, what's left of them. So we've gotta be prepared to take the kind of leadership that is not gonna be taken up by others, particularly the others that we already know are abysmal failures because they've been given the chance to lead and they've led us to this point of complete crisis. Okay, next question. Good evening. My name is John uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia. I was going to ask three questions, but it, since um, you know time is everything, I'll go ahead and ask one question tonight. In reference to the Glass-Steagall Act, the the platform for both parties is the Glass-Steagall. But based on when you read the statements from, let's say, Bernie Sanders and the Democratic Party, they're referencing the 21st century Glass-Steagall. My question is, what type of Glass-Steagall will that be? The, uh, that particular formulation uh, is a reference to a bill uh, that is uh, introduced into both the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives. That's the name that was given to the bill that was introduced by Elizabeth Warren, Maria Cantwell, uh, John McCain, and, uh, and uh, King from uh, New England. And um, we read the bill very carefully. Uh, it does not deviate in any way from the original Glass-Steagall Act. These are not uh, bills that require a team of lawyers to dissect and figure out what it says. The Glass-Steagall Act, the original act, was 37 pages, triple spaced, and uh, these bills to reinstate Glass-Steagall are even shorter. There are two bills in the House and, and one in the Senate. So basically, what they would do is uh, break up the banks, totally separate out the commercial banking functions from the investment banking, hedge fund, insurance activities. And what it would mean very concretely is there's no more bailouts of the criminal gambling activities of these financial institutions. What we'll be left with are clean and undercapitalized commercial banking operations 
and investment banks and insurance operations and hedge funds uh, that will blow up almost instantaneously the minute that there is no legal prospect of a taxpayer's bailout beyond the scale of what happened in 2008, there will be the fastest and biggest margin calls in history. And these things are going to just blow up. And Mr. LaRouche's attitude is good riddance. We don't need them. We need a national credit policy. We need commercial banks as the instruments through which to disperse credit into the real economy for infrastructure investment, for research and development, for job creation, and things that pertain to the productive powers of labor in a real economy. All of the other things, all of the gambling operations are absolutely unnecessary. And so, uh, you've got these bills, you know, the 21st century Glass-Steagall, they try to basically say, well, you have to make it explicit uh, that there'll be no more bailouts of derivatives and things like that. So uh, that that's really what you're dealing with. Um, we created the momentum for this issue. I can, again, not take the time to go through it here, but I personally know virtually every instance in which members of Congress either introduced these bills uh, or signed on to them. And it was in every instance, with no exception, a reflection of the work uh, that we've been doing around the country. The Manhattan Project is a flagship for this effort because uh, Manhattan, New York City, is a world center and so the radiating impact of what we've done around the country as it's impacted in New York, as it's impacted in Washington, has created a situation that otherwise would not have happened. So the Glass-Steagall bills as they are, are fine. But again, as Mr. LaRouche has been emphasizing, particularly for the last several years, uh, Glass-Steagall is the necessary, absolutely indispensable first step it wipes out the casinos. It wipes out an estimated two quadrillion dollars of leveraged derivative contracts that are a cancer sitting on top of the world banking system and the real physical economy of the world. But it doesn't restart the real economy. It doesn't create jobs. That's where you need the other elements of his four cardinal laws. You need to create a mechanism, a national banking mechanism, through which, as Hamilton did, as Lincoln did with the greenbacks, issue credit into the real economy for the kinds of projects that will rebuild our infrastructure, will create meaningful and productive jobs in the manufacturing and agricultural sector. We are in the worst infrastructure deficit of any country in the advanced sector. We have no high-speed rail. There is literally zero miles of high-speed rail in the United States. There is supposed to be an Acela line that runs between Washington and Boston, that's supposed to be high speed, uh, but it, it can't go at high speeds because there's not even the maintenance of the tracks to allow for high speed rail. Remember that crash that took place outside of Philadelphia when one of those trains tried to go somewhat close to high speed. In China, there are 18,000 kilometers of high speed rail and the Chinese plan is to have 30,000 kilometers in a short number of years. I traveled on one of those high-speed fast trains from Shanghai to Nanjing. It's the equivalent of the distance between uh, Washington and New York and a little bit further. And in China on the express train, uh, and the first class ticket cost about $25. Uh, it took 55 minutes. The, the train traveled 
at over 300 kilometers an hour average. And there's nothing even remotely close to that anywhere in the United States. We're in a situation where our physical economy is decrepit and getting worse. And so we need this kind of thorough overhaul. So uh, whatever kinds of fancy titles people may want to give on it, Glass-Steagall means only one thing. Break up the big banks, separate out the commercial banking functions, make sure that those commercial banks are insured and that they are issuing loans for real productive activity that boosts the productive powers of the economy. If we do those basic things, we can see a turnabout very, very quickly, particularly because we can join in with others around the world who are already on that trajectory. The United States is not just an Atlantic nation, it's a Pacific nation, and the entire Asia Pacific region, which has the majority of the world's population, is going through a scientific, cultural, and economic renaissance. And we need to make sure that the United States, which is a wellspring of most of those ideas, joins back in again. Okay, great. Next question. Oh, hello, Jeff Steinberg. Uh, this is uh, this is this is Wally in Denver. Um, you know, uh, of course, uh, uh, many people are, are very concerned about the uh, there's the Anglo-American war drive in in in, 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 in it's in Europe, and um, but uh, but I never hear anything about any uh, any resistance to to this war drive. Uh, uh, is that possible? And if so, why? There are growing pockets, more than pockets, of resistance to this policy. Um, and, and in some cases, uh, it's coming from uh, people who are in a position to genuinely do something about it the foreign minister of Germany, Steinmeier, uh, has made it clear. Uh, in fact, he specifically denounced some of the recent NATO maneuvers and the deployments of these tripwire forces uh, into the Baltic states and Poland. Uh, General Harold Kuyat, who was the equivalent of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the German Armed Forces for many years and later, later headed up the military committee of NATO, uh, has been adamant that the United States and NATO must forge a partnership with Russia and end all of these crazy drives for war. Now, in uh, late June, <clears throat> the Schiller Institute uh, held an extraordinary conference, a two and a half day conference over the weekend in Berlin. There were leading speakers from around the world including the former U.S. ambassador to Saudi Arabia, who was also a former deputy assistant secretary of defense, Chaz Freeman. Uh, you had uh, leading retired German military and French military officers. You had speakers from uh, China um, and uh, elsewhere around Europe. And one of the major themes of that conference was the war danger and the urgent need to do something about it. Uh, John Kerry has been uh, working very much in isolation within his own administration, but trying to reforge a strategic partnership with Russia, with Putin and with the Russian foreign minister Lavrov. Uh, they're making some significant headway. Um, but the danger, uh, of the kind of NATO deployment that was ratified at the NATO heads of state meeting earlier this month uh, really greatly increases <clears throat> the danger of thermonuclear war. The former vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, <clears throat> General uh, Cartwright, uh, last year penned an op-ed <clears throat> with the former director of 
intelligence <clears throat> for the Russian strategic rocket force, a general named Dvorkin. And they said, we're on the edge of nuclear war. It's a greater danger than uh, even at the height of the Cold War, even at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And both the United States and Russia have to step back from the brink. They've got to end this policy of launch on warning, which is a hair trigger uh, for launching a full-scale thermonuclear war. The former Secretary of Defense under Bill Clinton, uh, William Perry, uh, wrote a recent memoir, and he's been touring around the United States giving interviews and speaking at universities warning about the grave danger of nuclear war, whether by miscalculation or by provocation. So um, you're dealing with a situation in which, by and large, the mainstream media is part of the criminal enterprise that is driving the world towards this war danger. But I can assure you that there is an enormous amount of concern among very well-informed people. And again, you cannot in the least overestimate the importance of the role of this LaRouche political movement in daring to say things that must be said with no consideration for being politically correct and no fear about being attacked because the very survival of mankind is literally on the table. And so, you know, I would urge you, we're in the process in the next week, uh, we will have completed producing the full proceedings of that Berlin conference. Uh, you've got to get a hold of a copy of that. You've got to buy that report. You've got to read it because it will give you a sense of the kind of fight that's actually underway. And doing that and basically staying attuned. We have a daily alert service that is the only reliable source of information from around the world that gives you a battle map every 24 hours of where this fight actually stands. You will not get the truth not even close in the mainstream media because they are part of the wartime propaganda apparatus. So I'm not saying that this is a done deal and that the war danger has been pushed back or defeated. I'm just saying that there is a recognition. There is a fight and it's absolutely essential that you have access uh, in order to be an effective organizer uh, to the real story about what's happening. So it's a, it's a tremendous danger, but at the same time, uh, there is a real pushback. Um, and, you know, we've been saying from the very outset that this Obama presidency is a menace to humanity and Obama should be removed from office. He's committed crimes and misdemeanors, high crimes and misdemeanors that justify impeachment, including a series of wars that he's initiated without any permission from Congress, which has the sole authority to declare war under Article One, Section 8 of the Constitution. We had the same problem previously with uh, Bush and Cheney, but it's even more naked with Obama. He hasn't even made a pretense of going to Congress. So these are things that have to be fought out. And again, I can only say that we would be in a hell of a lot worse shape. We'd probably be at the edge or over the edge of a war of thermonuclear extinction if it weren't for the work of this political movement and allies that we've built up all around the world including in Russia. Okay, next question. Uh, this is Ken in Moline, Illinois. Uh, the CIA is an abomination, 
uh, an agency of the Antichrist and should be shut down and dismantled. Well, Jeff, that, do you have anything on that? Um, I think the comment stands on its own. Look, okay. you know, you 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 have uh, a situation, I think, where uh, you have agencies of the U.S. government that uh, are criminally complicit in the terrorism uh, that is stalking the world today, and I think that you know a, a great deal could be said to elaborate and sort of fill out the picture on what the uh, questioner just said. But I think, I think that uh, basically he's uh, sort of made the basic point. Good, let's take another question then. Yes, so this is Wayne in Virginia. I'm glad you're on the call tonight, Jeff. Uh, I was wondering if you could just address the real importance of the release of the 28 pages just beyond them being released, you know, how it affects other things that are going on in the world, especially what's going on in Yemen and how, you know, how it might even affect, you know, decisions that Putin might make. Well, look, I think the, the first thing I would say is that, uh, and I think I, I mentioned this just in the brief remarks that started the call. Um, if you take a number of uh, things that have all come out uh, in the recent period. Uh, you had the release of the Chilcot Commission report, which was a uh, comprehensive and damning indictment of both Tony Blair, as well as George Bush and Dick Cheney and others who uh, led us into a war in Iraq on the basis of completely false premises. They willfully lied to get that war going and we're paying the consequences of that 15 years later. Secondly, um, if you read the 28 pages that are now released, you've got to situate them within the context of the final phase of the war drive against uh, Iraq uh, being engineered by Blair and Bush and Cheney. Had that 28 page chapter been released, <coughs> at the time that the Joint Committee completed the writing of it, uh, there could not have been an Iraq war because it would have made very clear that the real authors of the 9-11 attacks were the combined British-Saudi apparatus. Remember that back in 2005, 2006, 2007, a scandal broke out around a project that was called Al Yamama. This was a project that was initiated by Prince Bandar bin Sultan, who was the Saudi ambassador to the United States at that time, and was the son of the longstanding Saudi defense minister who later became crown prince. He died before becoming king, but he was in the very inner, inner core of the Saudi royal family. Bandar worked out a barter deal between Britain and Saudi Arabia, where the Saudis provided massive amounts of uh, crude oil and the British provided weapons. Um, there were tens of billions of dollars in payoffs to various Saudi princes and defense ministry officials. Bandar officially got $2 billion as a quote finder's fee for the deal, but probably got a lot more. And through that arrangement, an at least $100 billion offshore secret fund was established for financing coups, assassinations, and terrorism, starting with the Afghan Mujahideen, who very quickly morphed into Al-Qaeda, which later morphed into ISIS and Nusra, and brought us what we have today. So you've got a British-Saudi apparatus at the heart of the British empire methods and policies that now stands thoroughly exposed, meaning that we have a unique moment of opportunity to dismantle that apparatus. You have another situation 
where HSBC, which was the original British Opium War Bank, back then it was called Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation. It was the financial arm of the British East India Company Opium War Policy against China. That bank still exists. It's the largest bank in Britain. And in 2012, a Senate committee published a 300-page report showing that HSBC was, number one, laundering almost all of the drug money from the Mexican and Colombian murderous drug cartels. Number two was working with banks in Saudi Arabia to launder money to Al-Qaeda and other similar jihadist terrorist groups. So all of this is out there. And what this means is particularly given the Brexit, given uh, other problems, the Scots and the Irish want to leave the United Kingdom, we have a unique moment of opportunity to dismantle top to bottom the empire that has been responsible for every disastrous policy in the transatlantic region for the last several hundred years. And that's an opportunity that we cannot miss. And therefore, what's really crucial is to understand that the simultaneous release of the Chilcot Commission and the 28 pages, last Friday, two top executives of HSBC were arrested uh, as they were trying to board a plane at JFK Airport to head back to England. So the dam is cracking. Way back in 1997, EIR published a special report called The Coming Fall of the House of Windsor. And that's exactly what we are seeing happening right now if we make sure that we don't stop in the middle of the battle to pat ourselves on the back over the 28 pages and miss the fact that now is the moment to aggressively go after the enemy as they're in a moment of retreat and to win a total victory. So there's many initiatives that will come out on this, but one way or other, the most crucial thing is that <clears throat> this is an opportunity to fully expose the crimes of the British Empire and give people a handle so that they understand what the real nature of this empire is. Right now, most people you talk to, you mention the British Empire, you know, they think of the guards wearing those funny hats at, uh, at the British Parliament uh, and don't realize that you're still dealing with a system of empire that thoroughly dominates pretty much everything in the transatlantic region. And it's now coming unglued and this is an enemy that we have identified and waged open warfare against for many, many decades. And now we're at the point where they can be decisively defeated. Uh, I discussed with members of Congress who were leaders of the fight to declassify the 28 pages. And uh, what, what basically happened, just to give a little bit of the recent background on this, Walter Jones, Stephen Lynch, and Thomas Massey, along with representatives of the 9-11 families, had a press conference on uh, July 6th. And um, at that press conference, um, the uh, members of Congress said that unless President Obama released the 28 pages, they were going to invoke the Pentagon Papers model and go to the floor of the House of Representatives and spill the beans on what was in those classified pages. And in point of fact, Congress has the authority without ever talking to the executive branch to declassify this material. There are hundreds of thousands of pages of material, vital material that remains suppressed there are 80,000 pages alone just dealing with one of the 9-11 hijacker cells in Sarasota, Florida. A federal judge is now reviewing those 80,000 80, pages to release them. Uh, the FBI suppressed that material. They never gave it to Congress. They never gave it to the 9-11 Commission. Uh, so the cover-up 
by the FBI is also becoming unglued as well. But what shifted the situation is when the members of Congress made it clear that they were not going to be stopped. And former Senator Mike Gravel, who introduced, who read the Pentagon Papers into the congressional record back in the 1970s uh, and played a pivotal role in bringing the Vietnam War to an end, uh, was targeted by the Nixon administration and the Supreme Court voted unanimously nine to nothing uh, that Gravel was perfectly within his rights as a U.S. Senator under the basically open uh, information clause of the U.S. Congress, of the U.S. Constitution, to let the American people know any secret material that was in the vital interest of the American people to know. That's in the Constitution. So the minute that it became clear that people in Congress were showing enough spine to actually guarantee that these papers would be released, uh, some of Obama's advisors whose number one con concern is his legacy, his reputation, said, well, they're going to come out anyway. We better do it now. And they tried to do it on the day that Congress was leaving town. So they were hoping that the, you know, bread and circus show of the Republican and Democratic conventions and then the presidential campaign and the six to eight weeks when Congress is out of session uh, would allow this thing to die down. Well, it's not going to die down. September 11th is the 15th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. And we're going to make sure that this is not just simply about the Saudis and about 9-11, but that this is about dismantling top to bottom the Anglo-Saudi empire and their Wall Street reach into the United States. Great. Here's another question coming out of the New Manhattan Project. Uh, good evening, Jeff. It's Patrick from uh, Connecticut. Uh, I've been using uh, the new signature uh, petitions uh, to to pers pers uh, persuade the population to join our movement. Uh, also, educating them uh, with the BRICS and the new Silk Road for economical infrastructure recovery through the through a credit system. Uh, my question is: Most people are so traumatized by the mainstream propaganda, they have no confidence at all that there could be any kind of change. Uh, how can we overcome this problem? Two words, perseverance and focus. Um, these are big ideas. Uh, and even in the kind of revolutionary period that we're in right now, where the Percy Shelley principle from indefensive poetry is clearly there. Um, it takes a certain amount of persistence and focus. Mr. LaRouche has always emphasized that any effective military operation, whether it's in the domain of politics or in the domain of pure military combat, uh, is always determined on the basis of who can conduct the most effective flanking operations. And in order to effectively carry out a flanking operation, you've got to be prepared to maintain a focus on the area where the enemy is most vulnerable and just keep hitting away, hammering away at it. And uh, what you're going to find over time is that more and more of the people who you're organizing and introducing to these profound ideas uh, are going to become infected with them. Uh, and it, it doesn't happen overnight. But right now, the main thing to be wary about is that there are going to be enormous distractions 
the mainstream media is conducting wartime propaganda against Putin, uh, some of it bordering on the absurd. You know, the, the, the campaign manager for Hillary Clinton, in order to try to divert attention away from these highly embarrassing uh, emails that were released by WikiLeaks the day the Democratic Convention started, uh, basically came out and said, well, we know for certain the technical experts have already told us uh, that uh, these emails were hacked into by Putin. And therefore, Putin is campaigning for Trump. I mean, you know, what a bunch of absurd malarkey. You're going to be getting all kinds of distractions and diversions uh, because people are afraid to talk about the reality. The reality is the transatlantic system is crashing down and it's the main driver for a war that could become a thermonuclear war of extinction. And people have a gut sense of that. So you've got to be prepared to cut through all of the propaganda, all of the crap that's going to be out there and stick to the key strategic flank. The key flank that nobody can touch is that this country is in an economic disintegration it's got to be turned around, and there's not a wide range of options on how to do it. And here are the steps that have to be taken. And by the way, the good news is that the majority of the population of this planet's already onto this program. They're already changing the directionality. China is now the leading country in space exploration. You know, this is a scandal. The United States used to be the driver through NASA for all of the pioneering breakthroughs in space exploration. And now we don't even have the ability uh, to launch an astronaut into space. They've got to go to Russia in order to basically launch up to the International Space Station on Russian rockets. So we, it, it, it's not that Russia or China are doing anything wrong by taking a leading role in space exploration. This next few years, you're gonna see extraordinary things coming out of China. Uh, they're about to send a lander onto the backside of the moon, looking out into deep space. We're gonna find out things. We're gonna make scientific discoveries that will be revolutionary over the course of the next few years. And the United States is scarcely engaged in this. So. These are things that people understand and they're actually passionate about. And so you've just got to, I think, as I say, perseverance and stay clearly focused on the strategic flanks and don't get distracted or diverted by all of the confetti that you're going to be seeing and hearing. Uh, we're on the right track. We know exactly what has to be done. We're going for a revolutionary change in how people think. Because right now, the overwhelming majority of our fellow citizens don't think like human beings. It's, they've been given a capacity for creative discovery, and they leave it on the sidelines and don't even think about making discoveries. So the first step, is getting people into the real world and thinking about the problems that they lose sleep of, or of uh, at night, but they despair because they don't know the solutions. We've got the solutions and we can draw more and more people into this political fight than ever before because we've scored some important victories and we're gonna go on from here. Suddenly, after the developments around the two party platforms, which has nothing to do with the candidates. Hillary is officially opposed to Glass-Steagall. Uh, Trump doesn't know what the hell he wants. But it's been the persistence on this issue that we've got to go back to something that had a 66-year proven track record. From 1933, when Glass-Steagall was signed into law by Franklin Roosevelt in June of 1933, until Bill Clinton signed the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act in late 1999, repealing it, 
we had a 66 year period where, yeah, there were bank crises. You had continental Illinois, you had the SNL crisis, but it never rose to the threshold of a systemic crisis because the commercial banks were clean, they were insured, and they did not get involved in the gambling activities. And if you wanted to run a risk and go to an investment bank and you know put your money in there to take a higher risk, you knew that uh, if you won, that's great. But if you lost, it was your loss. It wasn't a loss that you were gonna turn around and have taxpayers bail you out on. So that's, I think, the basic point here. Um, and you're part of the Manhattan Project. I know you've, you know, been, you were one of the first people to start getting signatures on that petition. And so, you know, you're doing the right thing and just, you know, don't get frustrated, don't get impatient, just persistently keep the organizing focus and uh, we'll make some real breakthroughs. We're in the period where that's exactly what's gonna happen. Great, so the next question comes up from an anonymous person, so if it's a little bit wacky, I'll just cut it off, but let's see what they got to say. Oh yeah, hi, uh, Jeff, this is Rock in Oregon. Thanks for the great briefing. Uh, I was thinking on this latest recent initiative from the LaRouches on the rescuing of Deutsche Bank uh, and the restoration of the Alfred Herrhausen legacy that um, uh, it would be useful perhaps if there were something uh, by way of a platform or a document or a proposal that Herrhausen himself had written that could be made available in English because I went online and I found three articles, or I believe, that you had written about his assassination over the course of a number of years, or over the span of a number of years. Um, and I found documents by Herrhausen in German that I have no ability to read. And and it just seems that this is such an important kind of a parallel or a, a dual um, uh, operation along with reviving the Hamiltonian legacy in the U.S. that maybe there would be something out there that Herrhausen had penned that um, LPAC could translate if there's the resources for that. So that was all. Um, th there's three things that you can easily access that you should read, but read them together because I think it'll give you a, a much broader picture. Um, first, and, and, and some of this you're gonna find in the uh, issue of EIR that should be uh, posting online uh, yesterday. Um, number one, uh, Mr. LaRouche's press conference at the Kempinski Hotel in West Berlin uh, in uh, October or November of 1988, when he announced that German reunification could happen uh, very soon, and that the key thing was for Germany to play a key role in helping Poland and some of the other countries uh, in the East to get over the economic crises. You were already at the point where the early signs of the disintegration of the whole Comic-Con sector, the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet Union was coming on. Virtually nobody else saw that except Mr. LaRouche saw it very clearly. Some of our own people in Germany were completely shocked uh, when he gave that press conference and talked about the imminent reunification of Germany. Then uh, you can easily find the text in English of the speech that Alfred Herrhausen was scheduled to deliver in New York on December 4th, 1989, in which he was putting forward proposals that very, very much echoed what Mr. LaRouche had called for a year earlier. And of course, Herrhausen was assassinated on November 30th, five days before he was scheduled to come to New York to give that lecture. And um, Colonel Fletcher Prouty, who we knew and collaborated with, uh, wrote soon after Herrhausen's assassination uh, that the cover-up of it uh, and the lack of media attention was a profound scandal and that the Herrhausen assassination was, for that moment in history, the equivalent 
of what the Kennedy assassination was in 1963. So you can go online and find Alfred Herrhausen's full text of his speech. It was to be the Arthur Burns Memorial Lecture in New York. And it's easy to find. Just type in, you know, Herrhausen, Arthur Burns Lecture, and you'll find it. But then thirdly, the, uh, I believe it was the April, uh, or maybe, no, it was the October 4th, 1990 issue of EIR, which you can find on the EIR website by just uh, going uh, to the uh, search engine. Uh, that was the first publication of EIR's Productive Triangle proposal, which was a further elaboration of LaRouche's core concept from the Berlin speech, and those same ideas were presented in uh, the uh, Herrhausen lecture that he was to give in New York. So Herrhausen was intervening in parallel to what LaRouche was proposing from a year earlier, and there's a, a lot more of a continuity there. Um, Herrhausen was the key economic advisor to German Chancellor Helmut Kohl. And the reason I say that you should read those three documents together in their entirety to get an idea of this historic moment, because with the assassination of Herrhausen and with the move against Germany by Thatcher, Mitterrand, and Bush, uh, Kohl uh, basically capitulated. Uh, and uh, he wrote about that years later in his memoirs about his years as chancellor. Uh, but we didn't give up. Uh, in fact, we escalated. We introduced the productive triangle proposal, which was an elaborate idea for uh, moving eastward, for reviving the economic integration of key parts of Eastern Europe as a step towards what a year later we introduced as the entire Eurasian land bridge. So again, I think, you know, the last uh, person uh, from Connecticut, Patrick, was asking about organizing, and I said perseverance and maintaining a focus on the most critical strategic flanks. Well, this is really another one of those perfect examples. And remember, we were operating under the most adverse of circumstances. You had the whole Bush administration, FBI apparatus, moving to destroy the organization, at one point trying to kill Mr. LaRouche. He was thrown in jail within days after George H.W. Bush's inauguration as president in January of 1989. So for that next five-year period, he was taken out of the equation. He was in federal prison. And if you think about the combined impact of the Harehausen assassination, and the frame up and jailing of LaRouche. Uh, Helga has often talked about the missed opportunity of 1989. Well, it was missed because the empire moved rapidly and in desperation to make sure that the moment of the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the entire Warsaw Pact and Soviet Union, did not represent an opportunity to end the power of the empire by launching the very policies that today are being put fully into practice through the collaboration of Putin, Xi Jinping, Modi in India, and now increasingly Abe in Japan is coming on board in reviving an old history of Japanese investment in overseas infrastructure. So these policies, were the core of the American system policies of the 19th century. And it's our duty, our battle, to make sure that the United States realigns with something that has a profound and deep history in our own United States. So, you know, find those three documents. They're all available. The Harehausen speech was actually hand typed by him in English. And a copy of that uh, is now widely available, but read those other two documents in that same sequence, because then you'll get a real taste of the history and what Helga means when she talks about the lost opportunity of 1989. And now we're in 
2016, and we cannot allow this great moment of opportunity to be missed. Okay, Jeff, well, we've been discussing for about an hour and a half. We've got a couple more questions. You want to take those, and then we'll wrap it up? Sounds good. Okay. Hi, this is Eric in Los Angeles. Um, I do have a question. I want to make a quick comment first. Uh, whatever you think of uh, Donald Trump, and I do not like his attitude about China, but I do like that he um, uh, spoke unfavorably of, of NATO and and uh, has hinted that it's time to, to sever from NATO. I, I like that part of his speech. Um, now, the question I have, I'm going to ask it with extreme caution because what I heard earlier today could be a rumor. It could be misinformation. It could be disinformation. But I'm asking to see if anyone has heard what I heard from a private source. And what I heard was that the person that, that leaked the emails about the, the Democratic National Convention scandal, the DNC scandal, was assassinated in the last 24 hours, shot, shot, uh, shot to death in, in, in his back, uh, in the back uh, at his hotel. Has anyone heard a thing about that at all? And, and what I heard was that just being completely covered up. So beyond that, I'm in the dark. Has anyone heard a thing about that at all? Uh, no, uh, but uh, now that you've uh, mentioned it, um, we'll definitely look into it. Good. All right. Here's the last question from an old, a good friend in Louisiana. Give me a briefing on Theresa May, the Prime Minister of Great Britain. Background. She's a uh, conservative party centrist. Um, she uh, actually didn't take a position one way or the other on the Brexit vote. She basically positioned herself uh, to be uh, a kind of an arbiter, uh, a, a safe person uh, to, um, to basically step in uh, if the Brexit vote went ahead and Cameron was out. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think that th there's nothing uh, particularly impressive one way or the other about her. I think what's impressive in the situation uh, is that um, people that I was speaking with uh, in London uh, were absolutely certain, this is two, three days before the vote, uh, that, uh, that Britain was going to leave the European Union. They had absolutely no doubt whatsoever and said, you know, the uh, media hype and the whole propaganda machine to try to stay in the European Union is not going to work because uh, there was a, a mood of revolt. We've seen it everywhere. Uh, it's very raw. Uh, it's very ill-defined. Uh, and so uh, you've got somebody who probably would have preferred to stay within the European Union and try to negotiate a better special deal now faced with the reality that she's got to negotiate something uh, completely uh, uh, new, and you've got Scotland uh, announcing that they will move very quickly for a new referendum on leaving the United Kingdom, um, and you've got Northern Ireland talking about a referendum to join Ireland and leave the United Kingdom. So I think, you know, Fred, we've talked for a long, long time about the nature of the British Empire. So I think you can probably appreciate as well as anybody on this call that uh, they're really uh, at a point of desperation. And we've got to make sure that, uh, that it goes all the way, that this system of empire is thoroughly dismantled. Uh, and that means that the whole vice grip of London and Wall Street on American politics has to be broken up. and uh, this is a unique historic moment. There has not been a period in recorded history where an empire was defeated and was not immediately replaced by some new variant 
on the same system of empire. It's the system of empire uh, that uh, has got to be dismantled and replaced by a system that's based on what John Quincy Adams called a community of interest among perfectly sovereign nation states and what uh, President Xi Jinping of China calls a win-win policy uh, where everybody benefits from collaborative efforts to increase the productive powers of mankind. So, um, you know, she's, if anything, uh, in a situation where the onrush of events, both the financial collapse, uh, the unraveling of both the British system and the European Union, uh, the major financial institutions that are on the ropes uh, are all London financial institutions. Remember, when Herrhausen was killed, Deutsche Bank went from being a major industrial bank uh, to becoming a gambling casino. Uh, they merged with Morgan Grenfell's in London, and that $55 trillion in derivatives activity I mentioned earlier, it doesn't take place in Frankfurt or Berlin takes place in London. So this whole British system is coming down as we forecasted the coming fall of the House of Windsor. And so um, I think that in that context, she's a very inconsequential figure uh, because the events that are on rushing are, are bigger than she has any ability to deal with. All right, Jeff, that's been a great discussion. If you have any closing remarks, we can wrap up the discussion tonight and get to work here tonight and tomorrow. Um, I would just say persevere and keep hitting the flanks and uh, keep a close eye on initiatives coming out of Manhattan because that, as Mr. LaRouche has been emphasizing for the last couple of years, is where we've got our greatest capacity to carry out these flanking operations and change history. Great, well, Jeff, thanks for participating and taking the time to have this discussion tonight. That'll My be pleasure. a wrap for the, yeah, thanks again. So that's a wrap for July 28th, Thursday night fireside chat. Check out larouchepack.com for further updates and of course the Friday night webcast tomorrow night. Thanks again and talk to you all next week.